coming up on the Drexel interview. Drexel University President John Fry discusses the importance of civil discourse in today's society, plus highlights relating to civil discourse from our long-running program. A lot of my work um, at the Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce was to convene around, you know, the big challenges facing um, Philadelphia. And so I spent a lot of my time talking about civil discourse. What can we do um, in a very civic way to bring our institutions and our neighborhoods together to think about how we take on some of those seminal challenges? And um, while, again, you can't solve a whole lot of problems in two years, you can get a whole lot of people to get to know each other. And some of the things that I think are beginning to happen now are the result of, of people meeting each other, honestly, for the first time and realizing that the differences that they thought they had are actually not quite that large at all. In fact, more binds us together. Now we'd like to spend the remainder of this episode sharing excerpts from some of our most popular and interesting episodes of the Drexel interview, featuring figures whom we think model the civility and seriousness to which we are devoted. As social critics, advocates for social justice, what would you like to see on the university campus or in the university curriculum or in general in education um, in the next decade or so? I want a, a radical uh, severance, okay, of um, a bureau a bureaucratic um, intrusion and powers into um, the lives of the social lives of the students, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to be trying to encourage the students themselves to rebel, okay, and to say, get out of our private lives, okay, because right now um, the, the movement is in the opposite direction, more and more controls by the substitute parent figures of the administration. These issues are not going to go away as we become more heterogeneous, more globalized. There are going to continue to be struggles over civil rights on all kinds of levels. We need to be having these tough conversations, and we need to, as educators, do everything that we can to promote everyone being able to participate in those conversations. And you don't have to be a socialist to be Marxist. I mean, Marxism is a, is a supposedly objective theory of history and the laws of motion of political economy and so forth. It's actually quite persuasive. I mean, if you look, if you look at, as a Marxist at the recent developments in the American economy and the stock market and the nationalization of industry and the um, falling rate of profit and the um, fight between finance and industrial capital, it, it's amazing. I mean, this is the, exactly the kind of thing that he was always so good at analyzing. I interviewed your friend Christopher Hitchens Ooh. before his death, Ooh. and it was one of my favorite uh, interviews Ooh. of all time. Um, I believe you share his views about religion. Oh, yeah, that, um, about and, that. I, I, yeah. There, there are plenty of things that Christopher and I disagreed about, yeah. but religion wasn't He was moving toward the right in some areas. Yes. Did you quarrel with him over that? Oh, yes, that? we argued about it a lot. Yeah. Now, that was one of the things about Christopher, is you could have the arguments. You, know, I mean, you could always have an argument. You could have him. the arguments, yeah. and it didn't really affect your friendship with him. You know, yeah. I mean, I strongly disagree. At that moment when he became slightly too close to the kind of Wolfowitz Cheney <laughs> gang. Yeah, he supported that yeah. war. Yeah. I thought that was uh, I mean I wasn't able to understand that really. And uh -huh. and, uh, and many of his friends, many of his closest friends argued with him constantly about mm -hmm. that. Uh, by the second year we knew we had a following and then by the third year I knew that we were doing really really beautiful work. And when I say beautiful work I mean that it was doing art that was really being impactful, that, you know, it wasn't arbitrary, that people were, um, it was the place to reflect on some of the issues that David was bringing up about the dysfunction of the American uh, society and cities, and specifically the drug war. And, uh, and so I knew it was a very special job. So to me, it makes absolute sense that we'd be fighting over monuments because that's a proxy for trying to figure out who we are as a people. Yeah, in order for that to happen, there's a period of deconstruction, and so there's a breaking down of what we thought did represent us, but now as we start to re-examine what is equity, what is representation, what do these terms mean? It's like, it's, it's like as a country, we're having an identity crisis, and it's good, and it's painful, and it's difficult, and it's hard. But these are questions that we have to be asking ourselves. And, and who are we? And who are we? Because yeah. when, when we put up monuments, it wasn't all we. 
And you see, when, when we neoconservatives began singing these hymns of praise to America, uh, we attracted an enormous amount of attention. Why? Because it was so unusual for accredited intellectuals to have a good word to say about America, especially mm -hmm. at that period. It was a man bites dog mm -hmm. uh, phenomenon. There were so few options for women in those days. Yeah. And I wanted to walk in a career where my mind would be my currency, um, where longevity in the career would be an advantage, not a disadvantage, um, and where no one could really stop me if I used my mind. Yeah. Now, the pressures, the other issues of, of class, race, and sex in school in those days, um, I think we've, we've talked a little bit about Sometimes it's easier just to put your head down, hunk it down, and go for it. Push through. Push through. Yeah. And so, yes, there were slights and obstacles and um, downright sexist, racist things that happened. Whites are often kind of oblivious to, uh, to some of these challenges. So I wrote this column, the first one, when whites just don't get it. And then, indeed, <laughs> got inundated with I can comments. To say, oh, you know, basically the problem is that, you know, blacks aren't marrying, aren't doing this, aren't doing that, it's their fault. And so then I wrote the second one, the one whites just don't get it, part two. And um, then I, I have in mind a possible third one that I may do uh, at some point. Part of civil discourse is acknowledging and taking seriously the anger of vulnerable people in response to injustice and understanding it as having been catalytic to many of the movements that have transformed this country in ways that have taken many forms, whether it's out street protests and, you know, peaceful ones, or whether it's acts of civil disobedience striking, the teacher strikes, the women's march, right? None of those were not civil. They're all civil, and they're all angry expressions. And we are at a turning point, and your work, it seems to me, is helping to move us to that next place. Thank you so much. Happiness is not a continuum. It's not this prolonged thing. Yeah. It's moments and how you appreciate those moments. So with the backdrop of all of the things that are going on, people are happy. If they watch a football, soccer match, they will watch it and talk and laugh. If they go to a disco, they will dance. They will love genuinely and truly. They will create families with the backdrop of all of this. So happiness is not the absence of challenge in one's life. It's with those challenges, the ability to move on, to live life fully, and that's the strength of my people. Uh, and so that's, that's what's in me. Thank you for joining us today for this episode. And please keep an eye open for our show in your local listings and online under its new title, The Civil Discourse, in the months ahead. Meanwhile, our catalog of over 15 years of the Drexel interview will continue to be broadcast in coming years and will be available in our online archives.